Ja? So, <laughs> so this is the last session uh, by Tone Ways, uh, analyst, trader, and content creator. Uh, you might know Tone Ways from last year's conference because he's slowly becoming a regular here. And he has a huge experience from Wall Street and now he is applying it in the cryptocurrency space. So uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting talk. Um, so last people are getting seated and I think that I will give the floor to Tone. Enjoy the talk. Thank you. Hey everyone, thank you for coming out uh, and thank you for hanging in there. I know it's the last session of the day. I'm, uh, I'm standing between you and alcohol, so I will do my best uh, to make it quick and it, it, it's going to be fun. So how many of you watched me here last year? Oh wow, good. Uh, so last year I went through the history of Bitcoin, all of its ups and downs economically and uh, I talked about uh, more of a Bitcoin price economic perspective. And um, soon after that uh, presentation, I started a new presentation called The Inevitable ICO Bubble. It's actually still called The Inevitable ICO Bubble in the slides. I totally forgot to edit that. Because um, on all the papers, it now says, has the ICO bubble popped? Now, the presentation hasn't changed. The environment has. And the presentation talks about uh, the similarities and very few differences between what happens in the ICO bubble and what happened during the dot-com bubble. So what happened um, going into most of last year and going into this year, as you know, with all of these ICOs, uh, I don't know how many of you were getting these emails, but uh, I know Jimmy Song is sitting in the front row. I'm sure he got them. Everybody wanted me to be an advisor for their ICO or their decentralized project. And that actually forced me to change my LinkedIn summary. And my LinkedIn summary has been saying the following for six months. I am not interested in your ICO token sale or token sale. Please send all requests to Vitalik Buterin instead, who is responsible for this nonsense, uh, to know why your ICO or token sale is probably a scam. My consulting rate is so-and-so, and I'll be happy to explain it to you. Um, actually, this has been around for over a year. Time really flies quickly. So um, I want to go um, through a couple of things. So, one of the things that people don't realize is that the price valuations are, tend to be very separate from the actual underlying fundamental reality. Now, we all know the internet was an amazing technology, but if you look at the price history of the NASDAQ, which is the technology stocks built on top of the internet, we had a peak in uh, March of 2000. Look uh, what happened during the crash of 2008. We were not even 50% back. We were at about 50% uh, drop back then. The NASDAQ, the value of the companies utilizing the internet did not reach all time highs until 2015. It took till 2015, took 15 years for the valuation to go back to the bubble top. But what happened to the internet during that time? The internet usage was going up exponentially. Uh, smartphones came out in 2007 or 8, and even that did not bring the NASDAQ back to its new all-time highs. So what happens? How do prices get so far out of control? So let's go and take a look. Let's dive in to the reality of the NASDAQ bubble. Uh, the first company, the first major company to really go IPO was Yahoo in 1996. That was shortly before Alan Greenspan uh, coined the term irrational exuberance, and clearly he was, you know, way early to realizing how irrational people are going to get. But uh, Yahoo IPO had an amazing first day. It had a 50% increase in the price of the opening price, and it closed that day at $33. If you adjust that for splits, it's about $1.38 in today's prices of Yahoo stock. The next really big notable IPO was Amazon. Amazon went IPO and gained 31% on opening day. Um, oh, there it is. 
Um, one IPO gained 31% on opening day, closed at 2350, which is approximately $1.5 uh, in today's split adjusted price. We'll get to pets.com later. That's a really interesting example. But um, around early 1999 is when things really started to get out of control. And the first notable company to take those things out of control was the globe.com. Uh, Theglobe.com was almost like all the things you hear today, you need to have your own money. Uh, Theglobe.com was you need to be your own internet. You need to have like your own uh, internet environment. You're going to be the internet. And uh, that, company was, uh, that company went up. It broke a record. It was up 600% on the first day of trading. Uh, the, it was supposed to open at about $9 a share or something like that. It closed the day at $63 a share, and on opening day, it traded as high as $97 a share. Everyone in that company became multimillionaires. The founders uh, are, uh, were worth hundreds of millions, and even their web developers were worth tens of millions of dollars. Um, uh, by 2001, of course, this company no longer existed, and it ended in a lot of lawsuits. Um, and uh, it did not end very, very well. That was the globe.com. Now, their record of a 600% increase on IPO day was beaten by VA Linux. VA Linux w went public and they were going to custom make your Linux machine. Uh, that stock opened to a bunch of fanfare. The opening price was at $299 and that was 700% above the anticipated ICO price. Uh, there is the stock chart of uh, VA Linux. It opened at 300 and in one year, the price was down to about $7 and it got delisted the following year when the price fell to under a dollar. Uh, that was VA Linux. Anyone here remember Cyber Rebate? Because I do and I'm not, uh, I guess I'm old these days. <laughs> Jimmy raises his hand. <laughs> so did you use it? I used it. No. <laughs> so Cyber Rebate had an amazing business model. It was going to be the future of the internet. Uh, so here's their business model, right? So this is back in like 1999. We were in college. Um, I think it was even before MP3 players. Uh, they were just coming out. So let's talk about a disc man, right? So a disc man would be like, I don't know, 25 bucks or something for an average disc man. They would sell it to you at $250 instead of $25. But if you fill out this rebate and mail it to them, um, they will send you the full rebate of what you paid within six months. So their business model was that half the people will never turn in their rebates and they would get to keep the difference. Um, of course, that did not happen. And there were um, over 10 people who they owed over $100,000 to. Uh, the company went bankrupt and people got paid about nine cents on the dollar. These were some of the ideas that were coming out at the height of the real estate bubble. Real estate, sorry, at the height of the NASDAQ bubble. Um, now, of course, when you have the money, you start to make crazy deals. AOL uh, bought Time Warner Cable for $156 billion. It's bigger than the entire crypto space combined. And um, I think neither company uh, exists today or Time Warner Cable only has a few days left uh, thanks to Netflix. So uh, a bubble is one thing, right? But some people can get out at the top. It's all about finding a way to get out uh, at the top, and sometimes you need to be more lucky than good. Here is one of those examples, broadcast.com. And uh, before broadcast.com, it was AudioNet. Before AudioNet, I think I already forgot the name of it, but um, what year was it? I think 1995, was it? Uh, around 1995, Mark Cuban uh, invested $10,000 into a company for the sole purpose of being able to listen to his Indiana college basketball games on the internet. And their goal was to put radio on the internet. Uh, with his $10,000 investment, he initially only owned like maybe 10% of the company or something, but he was the better businessman. He convinced the CEO that he should be the CEO uh, in order to take the company to another level. And they agreed, uh, the, founder of the founders of the company took a much smaller role. Mark Cuban took over. Mark Cuban took the company public in 1998. They rebranded uh, from AudioNet to Broadcast.com, took the company public. 
Uh, the moment they took the company public, it was worth $1 billion and Mark Cuban was worth $300 million. Nine months after taking the company public, Yahoo bought them out for, I believe, $6 billion. Uh, making Mark Cuban a billionaire in Yahoo stock, which he immediately sold and cashed out. Uh, within two years, Yahoo delisted broadcast.com and it was gone. So uh, that's the story of Mark Cuban becoming a billionaire, uh, basically through creating AudioNet. So if you can get out at the top, um, you do well. Now, NASDAQ corrected about 80%, and Wikipedia has an amazing list of all of the other success stories, or people thought they were success stories. But here is an interesting thing, because there's a lot of similarities to what happened back then to what's happening today. Let's take a look at eDigital. E-Digital changed its name from Norris Communications to E-Digital in January of 1999 when the stock was at a whopping six cents. By changing the name, uh, later that day, the stock price was at $2.91, um, um, or by December, within a month, it was $2.91, and, the, and then within a month after that, it reached the price of $24.50. So by changing your name from Norris Corporations to eDigital, within two months, your stock goes from six cents to $24.50, okay? Um, of course, the SEC took notice and didn't like it, and we already had a few similar stories, right? Here is a penny stock, it was trading at about five cents. They announced that they were gonna do an ICO and the stock pops to 40 cents. Uh, the SEC gets involved a little bit later. Here's a better one. The Long Island Ice Tea Company um, soars in its price on the exchange because they have changed their name to the Long Island blockchain. Again, everything you're seeing that's happening, it's all happened before. There is nothing new here. And when that happened, there was a good quote from the Bloomberg article where someone says, it's so reminiscent of what happened in the late 1990s. Uh, said Scott Nations, author, author of the book, The History of the United States and Five Crashes. Um, a company would simply change its name to something to do with the internet and their stock would absolutely soar. So what happened? The stock was worth, uh, looks like it was worth under $2. Uh, the moment they announced it, it says it right there in the print, the stock went up to $6.91. But it takes about an hour from the story that gets written to the story that gets published. You can clearly see in the graphic that the stock went all the way up to $16. So from $2 to $16 for the Long Island iced tea company by changing, uh, changing it from iced tea to blockchain. So that was pretty amazing. I'm not sure if the SEC got involved or not. Now let's talk about pets.com. Um, I actually do not make fun of pets.com because if we, go, uh, if we go and take a look when pets.com went public, it was only about nine months after Amazon went public. And here's the thing, pets.com is Amazon, right? They didn't do anything different. Amazon was selling books, pets.com was selling pet supplies. Both had the same business model, and um, no one knew um, which company was actually going to succeed. Do you know why I'm confident in saying that? Anyone wanna take a guess who the biggest investor in pets.com was before the IPO? Amazon. Amazon was the biggest uh, investor of pets.com before they went public. Uh, so even they didn't know, right? And this gets into this whole topic of, does the average person, why doesn't the average person have the ability to um, invest in these speculative pre-IPO companies, in these speculative pre-ICO companies, because you missed out on all those gains of Facebook. The rich people prevented you from profiting from Facebook. Here's what they don't tell you. None of you would have been invested in Facebook. My money would have been in MySpace. I liked MySpace. I hated Facebook coming in. I had to redo everything. I spent so much time learning HTML, setting up my MySpace page. I don't know how many of you were there back then. Um, and so many other social media, so social networking companies were there before Facebook. Friendster was there, Wimit was there, HiFi was there. There were so many of them. It didn't end. And uh, no one knew Facebook was gonna win, and they won. And the average person, unless they have the ability to invest in all of them, would have never done it. The time to invest in Facebook was after the IPO. 
The IPO was grossly overhyped. It fell over 50% within the first few months of the IPO. But what about after that? Facebook IPO at $40, it fell to 20, bounced to 25, fell to 17, and then went to 200. Okay, even if you invested at, at 40, you still made about five or six times your money. If you waited a few months and bought it at 20, you made 10 times your money with almost no risk, almost no risk of um, speculation. Are they gonna get wiped out by the next Facebook? Okay, so this concept that uh, the average people should be investing in these speculative companies is completely crazy because the majority of VCs, they don't beat the S&P 500. They actually lose people money. The difference is they're losing money for people that can afford to lose it, uh, which is not the kind of people that have been buying up all of these ICOs, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. So, um, so what else um, that we think we're seeing for the first time that was actually attempted back then? Well, how about currency for the internet? Let's uh, play this video and uh, check it out. You gotta get a gift for a kid. And you don't know what they want because you're old. Old, honey. Give them flus, online gift cards. It's just like money. You send it by email, they spend it at some of the web's coolest stores, and you come out hip and smart. It's graduation day. Duh. That was actually a Super Bowl commercial at one point. And um, so that was uh, Whoopi Goldberg um, advertising flus. And, um, oh, lost. Thank you. Um, and um, flus was uh, attempting to put currency unique to the internet. Uh, but here's the problem. Just like everything else other than Bitcoin, they were centralized. So how did flus end? In 2001, flus.com was notified by the FBI that a Russian organized crime syndicate was using flus and stolen credit card numbers uh, as part of their money laundering scheme in which stolen credit cards were used to purchase currency uh, that were then redeemed at stores. Uh, so that did not end very well for flus and they blew through about 35 to 50 million dollars of capital uh, and that's how flus ended. Oh, can I get uh, control of the... Cool, thank you. Uh, I am. Um, okay, cool, thank you. Um, so one more story um, of how, again, similarities. Uh, when you start Googling for interesting stories um, of uh, the current environment, and then you're like, hey, has this happened before? And here's one. So uh, sometime in 1999 in San Francisco, uh, some guy had a really cool idea. So what did he do with that idea? He wrote up uh, what is now called a white paper. Uh, he created a nice website, and he purchased a really awesome billboard and put it in a high traffic area in San Francisco with the funding that he raised. Now, what did that lead to? A company bought him out for $100 million. However, they wanted to make sure they integrate his idea, so they gave him a contract. You have to stay with us for three years to integrate your idea into our company, uh, and then you get to keep your $100 million. After about three weeks, they realized that the guy was kind of useless. So they said, why don't you leave, take the $100 million, we will integrate your idea on our own. Uh, so as he's leaving, he realized he never really had an idea, and he was able to short that company and make himself another hundred million dollars. And it all started with a billboard, and oh no, maybe the battery died. Nope. Well, that's unfortunate because I have a lot of slides, um, and. Um, and that all started with a billboard, and uh, that really, and I was, I found the story at the same time as consensus. Um, yeah, uh, this is not gonna be convenient though. I found that story the same time as I was at the last consensus, and there it is. I look out the window, and what do I see in Times Square? Um, a giant billboard of EOS. Uh, before they raised the four billion dollars uh, for EOS, okay? Um, Next slide. 
So how do a lot of these things end? Well, uh, next slide. Oh, it's not a clicker. Awesome, thank you so much. Cool, so how do a lot of these things end? How many of you saw the movie Wolf of Wall Street? Hope every hand goes up, there it is. All right, so, but does anyone know what did Jordan Belfort actually go to prison for? Uh, it wasn't for uh, his extracurricular activities, it was actually for financial fraud, but what kind of financial fraud was it? It was very briefly explained in the movie. Um, for only 15 seconds, have a listen, and then think about what a pre-ICO is. Let's go ahead and play it. An IPO is an initial public offering. It's the first time a stock is offered for sale to the general population. Now, as the firm taking the company public, we set the initial sales price and sold those shares right back to our friends. The I Look, <laughs> I know you're not following what I'm saying anyway, right? That's, that's okay, that doesn't matter. The real question is this, was all this legal? Absolutely fucking not. But we were making more money than we knew what to do with. Did you guys catch that? Because that was it, right? So basically, by being able to set the initial sales price, because they were taking the company public, um, what happens is you know what the actual valuation is, and you know what it's going to open at, and you know who to sell those early shares to, and you know when those people will be able to get out of a profit, and you know the kind of kickback you're going to get with that, plus you have shares yourself. So that is the reason why today very few companies are allowed to take the company public because they're able to keep their mouth shut and uh, they're not going to be uh, dishing out preferential treatment to the pre-IPO companies. And this is why so many people are complaining, how come I have to pay Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan or Deutsche Bank in order to take my company public and it costs millions of dollars and that's pretty much why. Because a lot of very notable people got in trouble for this. Um, so this is uh, Quatron, uh, can you pronounce his name, Frank Quatron, and um, he was sentenced and he was involved in, uh, in IPOs of Amazon and Netflix and uh, he was involved in several of the other high profile IPOs and he also got in trouble. I think he appealed and was able to get out of a prison sentence, but hey, that's uh, connections pretty much. So. So that's pretty much the, so some of the similarities that we had uh, during the dot com. And I'm going to wrap it up with uh, another little thing that, you know, I realized it during the ICO bubble. I was always fascinated because I was still in my university uh, during the dot com bubble. I didn't graduate till like 2002, 2003, so it was already over. But while I was there, a couple of my friends were finance majors. I wasn't, I was a science major at the time. And I remember one of my dorm mates, uh, he was also like 18, 19, he borrowed $1,000 from his brother, and he would like run into the common area, talk about the latest penny stock that he bought, and he's like trading penny stocks, uh, because all he has is $1,000. And I didn't understand any of that at the time. And then when I learned trading in like 2003, 2004, from the people that survived the trading environment of the dot-com bubble, you know, it always fascinated me how things got so out of control. How does a company trade on the NASDAQ for $100 a share, and then two years later it's gone because there was anything, wasn't anything underneath? How do people get into that? How does that happen? And then you hear all these stories. Hey, when your taxi driver starts telling you about the latest IPO, when your barber starts telling you about the latest IPO, and uh, my barber did come to me to buy a Bitcoin at 16000 That was great. Uh, it was, uh, and um, how does that happen? Well, um, that to me, I thought that that happened because of things like E-Trade and Scott Trade. Who remembers the E-Trade baby commercials, right? So the one difference between um, trading in the 80s and trading in the late 90s is that now you can trade from your own living room. All of a sudden, there weren't these boiler rooms that had to call high net worth individuals. All there was, was you. You can open an account, but it still wasn't as easy, right? Not everyone can trade. 
almost anyone can trade. You still needed to be 18. There was an age restriction. There was a geographical restriction, right? If you're somewhere in India, you can't trade uh, the NASDAQ US companies. And there was, you know, you needed a bank account. You needed to have some money. And if you wanted to be a day trader or a speculator, you needed $25,000, uh, the three-day rule. Um, or you got to hold your positions for three days if you don't have $25,000. So there were some restrictions. And all of those restrictions are now gone. So I would not have been surprised if this, or if, if the bubble is not even over. Because this bubble could go global. Because there's no restrictions at all. There's no financial restriction. There's no geographical restriction. You only have $100 to your name, no bank account. Please go and trade. Uh, go use the uh, no KYC exchanges. No one is stopping you. The funniest one, however, is no age restriction. Because here it is from my email box. Dear Mr. Vase, I am 15 and a half years old and in high school. I am interested in Bitcoin and I read and I've been reading your Twitter posts. I have $1,500 in savings and is asking for trading advice. Uh, but at least he's asking about Bitcoin. Oops, I should zoom in on the other one. Here's a better one. Uh, I'm in a conversation on Slack and here it goes. Um, I got a few of some token. I can't really see it. It's XCP, I think. No, it's not XCP, something else. Um, and asking me if I've heard of it. And I say, no, I have not heard of it. Not really interested. It's, uh, and the person replies, well, it's a gaming token. I'm like, well, I'm not interested. Well, I'm 13, so I am kind of interested in a gaming token. Uh, so these are your traders, guys. These are the people that are buying those pre-ICOs that uh, the insiders get first, and then they sell them to these people. Uh, those are your second level buyers. I really like these tweets by Alex Marcos. Um, he says, uh, here's one big difference between traditional startup funding and ICOs. Founders of failed startups shouldn't come away financially enriched. Risk capital to explore ideas is great, but incentives aren't aligned if founders make money at expense of investors, regardless of outcomes. I followed up on that uh, just to clarify the difference between ICOs and everything else. Um, because I had to reply to someone that just didn't get the fact that ICOs are just centralized schemes. Whether they're securities, whether they're you know, printing uh, their own money, doesn't really matter. They're basically there to separate um, unqualified investors uh, from their hard-earned dollars or Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is actually a new decentralized asset class. Bitcoin is the asset class, not crypto, just Bitcoin. Um, you don't decentralize Bitcoin by buying into, like you don't decentralize uh, Google by buying into Google's competitors uh, who are worth $1 a share. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin can be used as a currency and, uh, you know, and it has its properties. Unconfiscatable, censorship resistant, and hard monetary policy. Um, that's pretty much it. I do want to close out this presentation with a short video. Well, maybe not that short. It's a 10 minute video. It was a recent uh, documentary that I watched. And it really, and the documentary was made in 2012. Uh, can you just pause that for one second? Just click on it. Perfect. Um, and the documentary was made in 2012. The research was done, started in 2002. So this was all done before the world of crypto. Uh, there was one part in there about maybe five minutes in pay attention to it. It's called Distance from Money. The documentary is uh, dishonesty, the truth about lies. And uh, it really resonated with me and the current ICO environment. So um, let's have a listen and we'll do Q&A right after. What do you think? My name is Dan Ariely and I'm interested in human behavior. I'm interested in rationality and irrationality. I'm interested in the cases in which we make good decisions and the cases in which we make bad decisions. And in the last few years, we've been focusing on dishonesty. We watch corporate scandals everywhere. Enron, Worldcom, the financial crisis of 2008, we saw an increase in cheating in professional sports. We witnessed political deception and its huge repercussions. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. On one hand, we want to look at the mirror 
and think that we are good, honest, wonderful people. On the other hand, we want to benefit selfishly from being dishonest. As long as we cheat just a little bit, we don't have to pay any price in terms of the image and the way we view ourselves. And we call this the fudge factor. So this is the ability to misbehave and think of ourselves as good people. And you can think about all kinds of ways in which in your own life you have a fudge factor. The speed limit. Maybe it says 55, but are you okay in driving 60? What about cheating a little bit on taxes? What about exaggerating their online dating profile? <laughs> Across many studies, we find that everything that changes the fudge factor also changes people's ability to be dishonest. There are dozens of elements that can change the magnitude of the fudge factor. And we've been able to observe many of them in the lab. For example, if you can say to yourself, everybody's doing it, it's easier for you to rationalize to yourself that this is actually an okay thing to do and cheat to a higher degree. To study dishonesty, we need to be able to measure, hopefully precisely, the extent to which people are dishonest. So we have all kinds of methods. I'll describe one of them. You can just have a seat anywhere with a packet and a pen in front of it. We gave people 20 simple math problems. Find the two numbers that add up to 10. These are problems that everybody could solve if they had enough time, but we don't give people enough time. We are going to give you five minutes to solve as many as possible. At the end of the five minutes, please stop. Put your pencil down and count how many questions you got correctly. And now that you know how many questions you got correctly, take the sheet of paper, go to the front of the room, and shred it. People do that, they come to the front, they say they solve six problems, pay them six dollars, they go home. There you go, thank you for participating. What the people in the experiment don't know is that we played with the shredder. The shredder shred the size of the page, but the body of the page remains intact. And what do we find? On average, people solve four problems and report to be solving six. I solved six. I don't know if this is embarrassing or not, but I got six. I believe I got seven right. We've ran these experiments on 40,000 people. And so far, we found about 20 big cheaters. Those are people who cheated all the way, said they solved 20 problems, and they stole $400 from us. And we also found about 20-some thousand little cheaters. And they stole about $50,000 from us. And I think this is not a bad reflection of reality. Yes, there are some big cheaters out there, but they are very rare. And because of that, their overall economic impact is relatively low. On the other hand, we have a ton of little cheaters. And because there are so many of us, the economic impact of small cheating is actually incredibly, incredibly high. In one project, Dan and I decided to look at what's the influence of others' unethical behavior on our own decisions to cheat. So we designed an experiment with different type of conditions. So imagine the same experiment I described to you before, but with one main difference. We hired an acting student and 30 seconds into the experiment he raised his hand Yeah, I, I got all of them. Can I, what do I do? And they say, I solved everything, what do I do next? I should come up here and done. Now, this is 30 seconds into the experiment you are still on question number one. <laughs> there is no question in your mind that that person is cheating and the experimenter said you finished everything, you're free to go. There you go. Thanks very and much. And you see that person taking all the amount of money and going home. What would happen to your own morality? Well, lots more people cheat. But there could be two explanations here. One explanation is we just prove to people that in this experiment there's no downside for cheating. The second possibility is that it's not about the fact that they wouldn't catch you, it's about the fact that it's actually socially okay. Thank you for participating. And so we decided to study this by looking at whether the person cheating is somebody like us, or somebody we feel similar to, or somebody who's very different from us. We ran this experiment at Carnegie Mellon. 
Everybody was a Carnegie Mellon student. The acting student was a Carnegie Mellon student. We dressed the acting student in the University of Pittsburgh sweatshirt. <laughs> Now, what happens if you're a University of Carnegie Mellon student and a Pittsburgh student cheats? <laughs> You still know that you can get away with it. Here's the proof that somebody goes home with all the money. But you don't think that people like you are doing it. And what happens now? Cheating goes down. So it's not about the probability of being caught. It's about the question of what is socially acceptable in our circle. So imagine this, the same experiment I described earlier. You fill in your sheets, you solve these little problems, you shred the piece of paper and you come to the experimenter. You tell them how much money you deserve. You tell it in tokens. I solve X problems, I deserve X tokens. So now you pay them in pieces of plastic. They take this piece of plastic, walk 12 feet to the side and change it for dollars. So when somebody look you in the eyes and they lie, they don't lie for money, they lie for something else, but that thing becomes money very quickly. What happened? In our experiment, people doubled their cheating. There we go. Thank you. This, by the way, is the most troubling result I think we got. Think about it. In a society, we're moving away from money. Credit cards, stock, stock options, derivatives, dealing with people over so great distances. One. Could it be that as these distances and all of their versions are increasing, people find it easier to misbehave and still think of themselves or ourselves as good people? And I think the answer is absolutely, absolutely yes. If we took all the elements that we studied and we combined them into one environment, we would get an environment that is very similar to the one that operated in the financial crisis of 2008. Not in generations has Wall Street absorbed the number of body blows it took today. Three of the five biggest investment banks are gone. The country's biggest mortgage lender is gone. We had politicians, bankers, regulators, and even investors, all influenced by many factors. Self-deception, social norms, distance from money, lying for the benefits of others, and of course, conflicts of interest. And this is what I think corruption is all about. It's about that when you get into a system and something in the system tells you that things are wrong there, all of a sudden you abandon your own moral fiber. And because of that, we really need to figure out what can we do about it? How can we get people to behave better? Because if we don't, we're just going to get more and more disasters like the one we've just experienced. Many of the experiments that we have conducted are about trying to find ways to curb dishonesty. We went to UCLA and we asked about 500 undergrads to try and recall the Ten Commandments. How many of them do you think recalled all Ten Commandments? Zero, that's right. <laughs> By the way, they invented lots of interesting ones. <laughs> What happened after people tried to recall the Ten Commandments, even if they were unsuccessful? Nobody cheated. It wasn't as if the people who remembered more commandments, the people who are presumably more religious, cheated less, and the people who remembered almost none of them cheated more. Nobody cheated. It didn't matter what religion the participants had. You know what the Ten Commandments are about. They are about a moral code. They are about proper behavior. And just knowing that and being reminded of that decreases dishonesty. In fact, even when we take self-declared atheists, and ask them to swear in the Bible, they stop cheating. It is not about heaven and hell and being caught. It's about reminding ourselves about our own moral fiber. We found this result to be very promising, but we wanted to test it in a non-religious context. So we went to MIT and we did a similar experiment with honor codes. So we got students at MIT to sign the honor code. I understand that this short study falls under the MIT honor code. They did it, shredded a piece of paper. What happened? No cheating whatsoever. And no cheating whatsoever, despite the fact that MIT doesn't have an honor code. <laughs> Then we replicated the experiment at Princeton. Princeton has a very strong honor code. In fact, the freshmen get the whole week of a crash course on morality, lectures, discussion. So we took the Princeton students, 
signing the honor code and not signing the honor code, the MIT students signing the honor code or not. Was there any difference? No. When they did not sign the honor code, they both cheated to the same level. When they signed the honor code, none of them cheated. And I think this is kind of a mixture of good news and bad news. The bad news is the crash course on morality, particularly the Princeton version, doesn't seem to have any effect two weeks down the road. The good news is that even without a crash course, reminding people about their own moral fiber does change how people behave. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed that video. And uh, that's it for the presentation. And I'm open to Q&A. Um, um, let me ask a uh, first question, because I think it's, uh, it would be interesting if you can like, uh, tie this to your presentation. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, what is happening in the crypto space uh, is well, related to right. it was uh, the, the thing that really ties this to the presentation was the token part, right? And like, we even call them tokens. When uh, the distance from money and tokens, because you're just selling tokens. You're selling, or they've called them software licenses. They've called them, you know, utility tokens. You know, you call it whatever you like, and then all, look at all of this distance from money. Well, now you, gotta, you need Ethereum to get it, and then you have to turn Ethereum into Bitcoin, and then eventually you turn Bitcoin into money. So the further you are from the actual money, uh, the more you feel okay in doing what you're doing, but at the end of the day, uh, well, if the ICO bubble has popped, it actually wasn't that bad. But if we were to reach uh, you know, NASDAQ level proportions, um, and potentially we could have gone higher because it's no age restrictions, less restrictions, more global, um, the world as a whole is richer today than it was back in 2000 because, you know, again, um, uh, the world is generally gets richer over time. Uh, so it could have been a lot worse. So I kind of hope the ICO bubble popped because otherwise it would have been a lot worse. Um, so I think that part really should resonate with a lot of people and what these token sellers are doing. Thanks. Uh, do you think like just like after the internet bubble pop, there were a few legitimate companies that came up, you know, 15 to 20 years later, uh, the same thing will happen with ICOs? Um, sure, but you said it in your question. You said the word companies. They're companies, right? Of course, there could be companies if they manage, you know, uh, to somehow convince the SEC that, you know, not to arrest them or whatever, because they can't arrest everyone, right? Um, so, sure, companies can come out of this, right? Can a lot of these ICOs be converted to traditional stocks? Maybe, right? Because they have no utility as a currency. They have no uh, utility as a utility token either, right? Like, where would Amazon be today if you had to buy everything from Amazon with Amazon stock or Netflix stock, right? I mean, this is the, the recurrence, right? Well, you have to use our token to use our product. And our token has this financial component where it changes in value every second of every day. So it's literally like eBay only charging eBay stock that fluctuates in value for their products. How do you acquire eBay stock? Well, you got to go to E-Trade or you got to go to, you know, Ameritrade. Uh, you got to go to E-Trade and buy eBay stock. Okay, how do I go to uh, E-Trade and buy um, eBay stock? Well, E-Trade only accepts the currency of E-Trade stock uh, in order to buy anything from E-Trade, right? So, so you see the problem here, right? It's like every person speaking their own language uh, and you gotta somehow communicate. So none of these things work, they just make stuff up. So could there be companies that come out of this? Sure, but I wouldn't be looking at those companies. Um, again, I see Bitcoin as like the fundamental layer. We have one internet, uh, one internet today, we're gonna have one public blockchain of any use. Everything else is gonna be just private centralized stuff. So whichever companies are utilizing the Bitcoin blockchain, those companies can succeed and they are already succeeding. Several mining companies are succeeding very well. I mean, Bitmain is a little bit debatable, but they could have a, you know, they're valuing themselves as a billion dollar IPO. Uh, Bitfury is successful. Avalon is actually gonna go, probably go public before Bitmain because they're a cleaner company. 
Um, I mean, Coinbase is a pretty big company. I personally think they're a disaster, but um, you know, is it possible for a crypto exchange? Like, like who owns the New York Stock Exchange? Well, the New York Stock Exchange is owned by ICE. ICE was also an exchange. It was a futures exchange. It's actually not as old as the rest, but they did very well. They, they did great. They made a lot of money and they bought the New York Stock Exchange. So it's owned by ICE. Could it be possible that a crypto exchange has created such efficiency in the world, in the concept of being an exchange, and they got so rich and made so much money that they will then buy the New York Stock Exchange. They will then buy the NASDAQ, right? So companies that utilize Bitcoin well, uh, those companies can certainly succeed. Will any of these ICO companies succeed? I doubt it. Maybe one or two of them will, but even if they will, there's 3,000 of them out there. I'm not gonna pick the winners and losers. I'm gonna wait because picking the winners and losers is a horrible gamble and it's not worth it. Um, you're already seeing so many people that got rich a year ago are more broke today than, uh, than they were before. Thanks a lot. Hi, uh, what's your general opinion about uh, tokenization of securities and uh, could next Bitcoin bubble could be indirectly driven by security I'm tokens? I'm sorry, can you just say the beginning again? Yeah, uh, what's your general opinion about security tokens and could next Bitcoin bubble be indirectly driven by security tokens? I'm not exactly sure what security tokens are, right? I mean, if you're a security, you're a security. So um, if you're a security token, right? I mean, if you're a security, you are trading on a centralized exchange like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. If you're a security token, you're trading on top of an insecure technologically and all over the place layer, right? Whether it's Ethereum, whether it's Ethereum Classic, EOS, who knows, right? So by going with the security token model, you are basically putting every one of your investors at technological risk and regulatory risk because what happens if the regulators want to come down on your underlying layer, right? Like what happens if you are a security token and people own your token and Ethereum, you know, has another hard fork or which it probably will between proof of stake and proof of work, right? Like how do you explain that? Like, like by creating a security token on top of a, a layer you don't understand, uh, you may have a problem down the road and saying, well, I didn't know Ethereum was going to collapse may be an excuse. It may not be an excuse. But I think you're taking on unnecessary risk. If you're going to be a security, just be a security. Um, so the security token part, that doesn't really make sense to me because of the layer that you're on. Look, I, I have found, you know, two to three legitimate ICOs out there built as ERC-20 on top of Ethereum. And by legitimate, I don't mean good investments. I mean that they're honest about what they actually created and they weren't printing money for themselves and they actually had a use case. Um, now they still have the technology problem because they're building on top of something that is just not sustainable and not scalable. Uh, but at least, um, uh, now I, I can't mention these things because I don't want people speculating on them because I think they're terrible speculative instruments. They're not designed for that, but people will speculate them on it anyway. So there are a few honest ones and they can just migrate. They're not tied to that system. Uh, but if you're tied to your underlying system, you gotta trust it. I mean, I, I mean, I trust the Bitcoin blockchain. That's why I, I know I have value on the Bitcoin blockchain, but I don't trust any other blockchain to put my life savings on. God forbid my company onto it where employees are now dependent on it. Uh, yeah, but, but security con uh, tokens can be based on uh, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah, well, I mean, when they are, sure. Um, if that, the, then, it's, then it's probably okay, but I, w I think it's too early. I mean, Bitcoin may not be here in a year, right? Uh, it needs more time, it needs more confidence. How many people were quitting their jobs and starting a business on the internet in the you know, early to mid 90s? It took a while. It took people the confidence to say, hey, the internet isn't going anywhere. I'm gonna wake up in the morning and the internet will be working. Uh, when more people you know, have the confidence that they're gonna wake up in the morning and Bitcoin is working, um, and it has been. Bitcoin has like 99.99% uptime. If that can continue for another five to seven years, then we could see something like that. 
security tokens built on top of Bitcoin uh, because that's a strong layer that will be functioning every single day at 99.99%, hopefully better, uh, uptime. But Ethereum doesn't have that kind of uptime. And, but it, it may now because Ethereum has competitors now. So now you can create your ICO on everything. And I've been saying for a while, ICOs, they don't need a decentralized platform. Uh, they're centralized entities. Every ICO is a centralized entity. It's part of a company. The last thing they need is an unsecure, decentralized, most inefficient blockchain to move on. Uh, they want efficiency. Uh, Bitcoin layer is not the most efficient database. It's probably the most inefficient database, right? So you would need a side chain. Maybe a rootstock will do something. Uh, maybe you can build something with lightning. Uh, you need efficiency. You don't need decentralization there. Uh, you just need the ability to quickly move something. And a centralized database can do it better. Now, the current centralized databases are kind of old, so maybe they're not doing it better, but the future centralized databases will do it much better. They can call it a blockchain, but we all know that, you know, it's, if it's not proof of work, it's not really a blockchain. That's the invention of Satoshi. Thanks. More questions? Oh, while we for the next question. Um, so I'm sure everybody knows Jimmy Song as well. Um, we are doing our traditional carnivory dinner uh, Sunday night. Uh, so if you Google our carnivory dinner uh, or go to Jimmy's Twitter, or I'll tweet it out as well. Uh, so there is an Eventbrite. Uh, so you can sign up if you want. Uh, and that's going to happen Sunday night uh, at uh, Brazilian Barbecue here in town. So just Google carnivory dinner Prague, and it'll show up at, on Eventbrite. Oh, right there. Question. Oh, no, Hi, yeah. No, I, uh, I have a question for you. Ah, uh, yes. I was just hoping that you could reiterate possibly your uh, confidence. You stated previously that we have one internet. Uh, I think the, the reality of the structure of the internet is quite a bit more complicated than that uh, in terms of where packets can originate, where they can go, where information can flow. Uh, I was hoping that you could perhaps reiterate your confidence that Bitcoin will be uh, the ultimate victor uh, amongst all of the different coins out there, some of which address serious flaws in Bitcoin, uh, which uh, enhance uh, certain features such as fungibility or allow for different use cases that Bitcoin simply isn't intended to address. Um, so if you could perhaps reiterate why you think that Bitcoin will be this, this one public chain sure. and sure. Other, other coins will, will sure. fail. So um, you're right, the internet is pretty complicated under the hood, too complicated for me to even comment on it because I don't really understand it. Uh, but what I do know is that I only have to build my website in one place. I'm not building my website on five different internets. Uh, so that's convenient. Um, I know China kind of has their own thing, and I think that's been holding them back a little bit. I think China could have done much better by being more technologically open. As far as um, Bitcoin being the final winner, um, well, Bitcoin had several things going for it that not nothing else did. Bitcoin is by far the most decentralized uh, coin we have. The reason for that is Satoshi was invisible. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't have a leader. Any other coin has a leader. Um, a lot of the other coins, I don't hear it so much anymore because I guess the trend has died. Talking about we have better governance. Well, if you have better governance, then you are simply more centralized. Um, no one controls Bitcoin between the nodes. We have nodes, we have miners, we have core developers. It's by far the most decentralized core developer team. It's by far the most decentralized mining. Um, operation and it's by far the most distributed token we have. So um, while some coins temporarily might have better privacy, uh, they might be faster, but the, the reason why they're faster is because usually nobody's using them. Um, Bitcoin does have the brightest minds in, uh, in any, uh, like miles away from any other project. And um, it's not the fact that it was first, it's the fact that it grew in the wild. Nothing else grew in the wild. Um, everything else has central leaders and uh, people that have a disproportional say in what happens next with that token. Uh, they are much more coerced. 
And um, those other tokens are a lot easier to infiltrate, uh, and they're a lot easier to you know, create future bugs. So um, you just can't replicate what Bitcoin did. It was worthless for a year and a half. Uh, people were working on it. The, the amount of money and effort that, got put, that was and still is being put, in, being put into mining is just not replicatable. Um, any other token is at risk of being attacked because you have a higher level token like Bitcoin to move that money into and still profit. Bitcoin is the only one where this current bug that was found, like only 7% of the nodes are upgraded to fix that bug, so what? No one is gonna execute that bug because all you will do is destroy all the blockchains, right? And external people can't execute it because you need a giant mining operation that is already functioning. And uh, executing that kind of a bug on Bitcoin would just ruin confidence in all blockchains and everything goes to zero. Um, Bitcoin is, has the highest store of value property, right? So here's the thing. Myself included, and I'm sure many of you in the audience, and a lot of people with a lot more Bitcoin than me, have been trusting Bitcoin with their store of value. Uh, imagine if all of that goes to zero. Why would I ever trust any other blockchain with a store of value? Like, there's only one shot to get the store of value right. And if, um, it's not like switching from my MySpace to Facebook. There was no store of value property. So if the store of value has to transfer to another coin, why would anyone trust that coin with future store of value? It can just be replaced by another blockchain. So the store of value property is gone. And when a store of value property is gone, what you have is the Venezuelan peso, right? You just want to get rid of it as fast as you can. I mean, sure, I mean, Bitcoin is the only currency that I accept for my workshops and stuff, but I keep most of it in Bitcoin for as long as I can. Um, if the store of value property of Bitcoin is gone, I'll accept Monero, I'll accept the shit coins, I'll accept anything, it doesn't matter, because the moment I get it, the first thing I'm gonna do with it is I'm gonna sell it for the US dollar. And then the next thing I'm gonna do with it is I'm gonna move it into the S&P 500. Uh, because the, your best store of value is the stock market, uh, which has gone up, what, 10,000% since the creation of the Fed? Uh, your, your gold coin still buys you a suit, like it did in 1930s, but if you sold that coin in, you know, in the 1920s, instead of uh, you know, holding on to that gold coin. Uh, you sold it in 1920, you put it in the stock market, probably buy, I don't know, 100,000 suits today. Um, so your store of value needs to adjust for inflation and increase in technology, which the stock indices do. Uh, I think Bitcoin is a great store of value for now. Uh, hopefully it will continue. But um, yeah, the store of value property is huge and people underestimate that. People think that you can just move store of value somewhere else. You can't. All right. Um, so we, we have, have time for one more? Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, last question. Okay, so you mentioned uh, the stock market is the best investment, but if Bitcoin uh, becomes the global currency, Having Bitcoin savings will, will be the same as having uh, it in a global index fund. Do you agree? Um, it's a different uh, type of investment. I mean, Bitcoin is still going up in value very, very quickly uh, because it's so young and, you know, the world isn't using it. Um, you know, if Bitcoin is still with us 50 years from now, 100 years from now, um, it may not increase in value anymore at that point because population isn't always increasing, right? I mean, look at Japan, look at Europe. Uh, I think America's uh, birth rate is still higher. So all of these fears that the world is gonna get overpopulated, uh, they're not exactly true. Uh, most modern countries, the birth rate starts to decline. Like Japan has a huge problem with this. So eventually, for now, sure. I mean, as long as Bitcoin is becoming, um, uh, as long as Bitcoin is rising, you can look at oil the same way, right? Like in, what, 1880, you bought a bunch of land in Texas, you stuck a shovel in the ground and a bunch of black goo came out. You just got, you know, scammed for buying land. Uh, 20 years later, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to you, right? And the price of oil, like, skyrocketed during, uh, you know, during the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. 
but the price of oil has pretty much stabilized, right? I mean, no one sees oil these days um, as uh, that speculation and increase in value. So that can happen to Bitcoin, but that's a long time away. And then once again, we're back to capitalism. We're back to doing something productive. You know, bad companies disappear. Kodak was the number one company in the 80s. Now it's gone. Uh, you know, Blockbuster was doing well. Now it's gone. Uh, you no, know, now we have uh, you know Amazon and Netflix and Google and Apple. And in 20 years, there could be different companies replacing them uh, because uh, companies come and go. So eventually, when Bitcoin no longer has that early stage growth, it will be it will just be the currency of the world, and you're back to having you know companies as your investments. You just have to diversify. Can't you know? put everything into a single company because they come and go. All right. Thank you so much, Tone, for this talk. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. This was the last session of today, uh, but you don't have to go home. Um, we have a party starting in front of Studio One. We will have a live music performance tonight. And tomorrow we open at 9 a.m. and the first talks start at 1 p.m. Um, enjoy tonight. Don't get drunk too much, but also not too little. And enjoy the evening and see you tomorrow. <laughs>